Good afternoon, Nitu. Uh, thank you for having me this uh, afternoon on the sidelines of the Oasis India meeting being held in Adelaide, South of Australia. It's a pleasure to be associated with the process. My name is Joe Tapera Mishi. I am the ambassador of the Republic of Zimbabwe to the Commonwealth of Australia. So I'm going to shoot out a few questions and it would be kind enough to respond to those. As Zimbabwe's ambassador at the 2023 Horasis meeting, could you share your perspectives on the event and any specific details or highlights you think are important? In what ways do you plan to showcase Zimbabwe's economic potential and the Horasis meeting, particularly in the sectors ripe for foreign investment? Thank you, Niti. Uh, the Horasis Global Community or Global Visions Community is an important platform uh, for any country that aspires to project uh, the potential that it possesses as a destination of investment. Uh, this uh, covers both trade and new business ventures. Uh, it also covers the socio-economic sectors of human well-being. It is a platform, furthermore, that is very important for it, it cut, you know for making those important contacts that augur well for you know demystifying the potential for individuals from different parts of the world to reach out together in the spirit of you know cultivating win-win business outcomes. In that context, uh, as a representative of Zimbabwe, the Horasis uh, meeting taking place in Adelaide uh, is, is giving me and has already given me immense opportunity to connect with persons that previously I have never known. I have been able to identify those people with interest in the sectors of Zimbabwe's economy that hold potential for investors. I'll just give you a you know, highlight of some of these sectors. Zimbabwe is uh, traditionally known as the breadbasket of Africa and uh, a situation that uh, was dented uh, following the land reform program in Zimbabwe. In natural because we had to do some structural you know, uh, reorganization of the agricultural system in Zimbabwe. We had to, uh, you know, allocate land to new farmers. And I'm glad to say that program itself empowered as many as 360,000 households with access to land, where hitherto we only had a few, you know, privileged uh, individuals for some 4,600, you know, segment of the population owning as much as 95% of the land of Zimbabwe. Now, that land uh, sector in Zimbabwe is holding immense opportunity uh, that already is showing that Zimbabwe is on a trajectory to regain its traditional status as the breadbasket of Africa. Some quick highlights. Uh, since independence, Zimbabwe has never been known as an exporter of wheat. As I am talking now, uh, the information on the ground is that only Zimbabwe and Ethiopia have wheat surplus on the African continent. Uh, I think we should be saying thumbs up to the Zimbab to Zimbabwe's land reform program. Uh, again, the staple food of Zimbabwe is maize. And you know, from maize you produce the carbohydrate, uh, the sadza, as we call the traditional dish in Zimbabwe. And uh, as we are talking Zimbabwe again, it's in its third consecutive year of maize surplus. What does that say? It says that the land reform is delivering, uh, contrary to the you know information peddled in some of the media that Zimbabwe uh, destroyed its economy because it carried out a land reform. Uh, the reality on the ground is showing that the land reform is uh, given impetus not only to food security, sustainable food security in the country. But it's also empowered, a, you know, households at the community level. A, the rural communities are now empowered in Zimbabwe as not only landholders but 
you know, self-sufficient producers of what that, of that which they need to to sustain their families, and also a bit to to to, to put on the market and gain some income. Now, interesting about land reform in Zimbabwe is that we are addressing food security at the household level. How are we doing that? We embraced what you call climate-proofed agriculture. Uh, this agriculture is actually saying we are going to have science as the basic ingredient for uh, you know guiding how we conduct our agriculture program in Zimbabwe, uh, which at the moment is under the national program called land that is called agriculture mechanization and modernization. And uh, again, I want to say that um, we've addressed uh, food security at the household level through a presidential input support program for uh, households and also for commercial farmers. At the household level for supporting those marginalized individuals in society, government is availing seed, chemicals, and um, you know, technical support through our agricultural extension officers that the country has as part of its uh, traditional way of running agriculture. So, uh, the households level, they do not have to pay back for the, you know, costs incurred in advancing these uh, basic inputs because the choice is, do you give food and outs or do you capacitate households to act a living on their own from the resource and the support that the government gives. And we think what is sustainable is to capacitate people to be able to, you know, fend for themselves. But then you have the A2 farmers who are on the commercial side of agriculture, those, they are advanced support by government, but on cost recovery basis. That is at the end of their production cycle, they do uh, have to pay back to the, to the government. And now, the next one is mining. Mining uh, is the second contributor to the GDP of Zimbabwe, 13.6, 13.7%. And uh, at the moment, the target for government is uh, to achieve at the end of 20, by the end of 2023, a 12 billion mining sector in Zimbabwe. Uh, this is coming from 2021, where we had six point something billion US dollars sector. So we are talking of a mining sector that is uh, grown by 100% in the last two years. It's a phenomenal uh, 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 change. For the investors here at Horasis, what we are saying is uh, Zimbabwe has what it takes to effectively marshal that transition uh, from the use of uh, non-renewables to renewables forms of energy. What is the gift that Zimbabwe has? It is the, you know, a mineral resource endowment uh, that uh, we can only thank, uh, you know, whether it's destiny, uh, whether it's the, our maker, but certainly we're grateful to be sitting on more than 60 recorded mineral resources known on planet Earth. These include the critical minerals that we need for the transition to, you know, the green economy. We have the lithium. Zimbabwe is, uh, you know, in, uh, in possession of uh, the greatest lithium resource endowment on the African continent, as we speak. Chrome, Zimbabwe possesses a large deposits of chrome and mainly along what they call the Great Dike. Dike. That's a mountain range uh, that you find running for over 600 kilometers from the south, southeast part of the country, northwards. So on the Great Dike, also you find uh, not only uh, chrome, but Zimbabwe also has uh, minerals like manganese, cobalt, we have diamonds, we have platinum, the platinum group of metals that is. We also have uh, zinc, tin, we have nickel, uh, we have iron. In fact, I should not miss to speak uh, on this occasion that Zimbabwe is uh, at the moment, uh, you know, div uh, establishing what will be the biggest integrated iron and steel production in Africa. Uh, this is called Manije, a steel uh, plant that is an investment by the Chinese uh, in Zimbabwe. And we, you can imagine, you know, if you're talking of industrialization, what a stimulating role uh, iron and steel uh, production has for any country. 
So we are soon going to be having, a, for example, downstream a production of a stainless steel, steel itself to begin with, coupled steel, let's say, coupled steel, the most basic. We have that capacity now to produce in Zimbabwe. And we have to also the capacity to produce those with who would wish to produce stainless steel. This is high grade steel, including 30.304. You know, so mining sector is a big employer in Zimbabwe. It is a big uh, uh, source of uh, revenue to you know to the economy. And uh, another sector I should talk about in the interest of time is the tourism sector. We have uh, traditionally said in Zimbabwe tourism. Uh, represents a low-hanging fruit in Zimbabwe. Low-hanging fruit in that uh, the investment outlay required uh, before you can start generating re revenue is not huge. Zimbabwe is uh, a, a moment with a tourism uh, you know, strate development strategic plan that has identified uh, certain tourism development zones. Uh, Victoria Falls is one of those where if you are an investor today, you came into Zimbabwe, for the first five years of your operation, you are subjected to zero tax. After five years, you are subjected to 15% tax of your, you know, your, your, your gross revenue. And thereafter, you have 20%. So these are incentives meant to, you know, to attract investors into these designated tourism development zones. I, I, I should also say that you have a duty rebate on your import of uh, capital goods for setting up the business in these uh, uh, designated tourism development zones. So it's not only Victoria Falls. You have uh, development zones in Bulawayo, which is the second largest city of, of Zimbabwe, and you have uh, Harare itself is, has got a development zone. You have the Eastern Highlands, uh, you know, the, the Eastern Highlands is what uh, traditionally is what is called Little England because of the weather pattern there that mirrors, you know, temperatures of 10 in, in the United Kingdom. And uh, so we have both cultural tourism, we have, of course, a, a photographic tourism, we have people who come for safaris in Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, we are fortunate also to have a large the big five in Zimbabwe. You know, and if you've heard of the big five, I'm essentially talking here about your, your elephant, your, you're talking about the lion, you're talking about the rhino, you're talking about the, 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 uh, the, the hippo, you know, so the buffalo, you have all those in Zimbabwe. So you be spoiled for choice in terms of tourism products to enjoy in Zimbabwe. You can come for, for water rafting, uh, water rafting on the, the, on the Zambezi River. Uh, you can come to Zimbabwe also for simple the cultural tourism uh, because Zimbabwe is endowed with a rich and diverse culture. Uh, and um, now the other sector, the last sector uh, that I want to talk about is the energy sector. Zimbabwe is for a number of years until recently experiencing a, a, a deficit in energy supply. But the country is also allowed now the duty-free importation of solar systems. And this is something that investors would want to seize upon. And uh, not only are we now you know, embracing a solar uh, energy, but we also have uh, you know, mini hydro power plants. There's room for people to set up those investors can come to Zimbabwe and uh, set up a mini hydro power projects and uh, be able to feed into the national grid and you know, on predetermined, uh, like I could say, off-tech agreements with, with, with the power utility in Zimbabwe. Uh, we are also looking at, uh, uh, at, at the moment, you know, wind energy. If some investors like I've met here, they have expressed the desire to explore opportunities for investing in the wind sector in Zimbabwe, and they're most welcome. And so I have been engaging individuals with that, uh, you know, propensity to invest in sectors for which there's uh, that great potential in Zimbabwe, I have shared with them a, a brief on the economy of Zimbabwe, and uh, they are going to be perusing, browsing through, and while I'm still here, they have the opportunity to come back to engage me and see how we take the process forward. So taking from what you just said, I mean, I understand there are huge opportunities. I mean, they're immense, and the best is that there's a lot of government support 
to actually facilitate these uh, opportunities and partnerships. So, I mean, not everybody can find you. What is the best way that, what are your guidance in terms of how can they approach this? Who do they reach out to? Is there a trade, a common sort of a trade portal they can go on to? How, how do they even express their interest in the country? Well, if uh, they went online and uh, Googled Embassy of Zimbabwe in Australia, they would find the Embassy website. All right. Yes. But is there a generic portal that is uh, uh, sort of uh, hosted by the government itself where yes. you can directly... We, we, we have a, a www uh, gov.zw that's a, a, a government of Zimbabwe portal and under that they can uh, uh, go to the Ministry of uh, uh, you know trade Ministry of uh, until recently was Ministry of Finance under which our Zimbabwe Investment Development Agents falls but I would suggest they can also go straight and, and Google for ZIDA ZIDA is the Zimbabwe Investment and Development Agents there they will find all the information they wish to access. There they will also be guided on how they can go about, you know, That's bringing true. their investment into That's Zimbabwe. That's really helpful. That yes. is really helpful. So how is Zimbabwe aligning its development and investment opportunities with sustainable practices? And what initiatives in place to ensure environmental conservation? Well, it's, it's at the institutional level. In Zimbabwe, we have what we call EMA, Environmental Management Authority for any investment before it is undertaken uh, the prospective investor has to obtain an EMA certificate which means uh, the EMA itself will uh, look at the intended investment and uh, assess the likely impacts negative uh, you know many uh, on the environment and uh, socio-economic factors uh, being considered and then they will either grant a certificate of clearance or they would uh, deny uh, the, the investor the right to carry out that investment. So what are the efforts being made in terms of Zimbabwe to develop its education system and workforce to meet the demands of a growing economy and to attract international businesses? Well, uh, you, you know, UNESCO for many years always rated Zimbabwe's education as uh, exemplary. Uh, that Zimbabwe is a high, uh, you know, a, a low illiteracy rate. Uh, you know, and we pride ourselves in that because since independence, education received the bulk of the budget of the government. This was a deliberate effort uh, arising from a realization that in order to be able to, you know, uh, build that Zimbabwe that we want, we needed to be to have the capacity to do so, and uh, no other capacity uh, ranked higher than the, the uh, you know education. So we have an educated uh, workforce in Zimbabwe. We have a disciplined workforce in Zimbabwe, and uh, even here in Australia, we have uh, so many Zimbabweans. And uh, met here, uh, you know, government officials who we have said, Ambassador, we uh, applaud the contribution of uh, people of Zimbabwean orig origin in the societies in which they live, various societies in which they live in Australia. Now, coming back to Zimbabwe, we have embraced a, a, you know, a, a new education dynamic uh, falling under what you call Education 5.0. Uh, we are saying now the, the education system in Zimbabwe should not be churning out graduates with a mindset attuned to seeking jobs. You know, uh, this has always been the case that you graduate child at high school or at university and you are, must be skilled at drafting letters for seeking employment. Now we are saying we want to uh, produce, you know, our academics, uh, institutions or centers of excellence must produce that individual with a, a capability to be innovative, to design and uh, to produce. So we are saying now, in fact, most of our universities now have what we call uh, innovative innov innovation hubs. You know, uh, each university is designated to specialize on a certain uh, uh, um, production uh, process. 
for example, you have a university that is the center of excellence, uh, pro innovative hub, innovation hub for, for, for pharmaceuticals. Another one is in uh, livestock production, way of operating. The interest in that our artificial insemination uh, program in Zimbabwe, uh, what you call the CAT uh, abbreviation for Chinoy University of Technology, is, is a product of the university. Now we are now uh, you know, ex uh, expanding livestock breeding program in Zimbabwe catches of this artificial insemination that comes from an innovative hub in Zimbabwe. So uh, that one, that's one way that we are ensuring that uh, our industry will be uh, supplied with the requisite uh, labor, a labor force that is uh, proactive, that is an agent of change, both in terms of our aspirations for industrialization and modernization. So I understand that you've had a great meeting, as you said, you've met some very interesting people. And I also believe that Frank said that you would be interested in taking Horasis to Zimbabwe. So um, how do you uh, think it's going to benefit the meeting going to Zimbabwe? How would it uh, affect uh, positively? What are your key goals that you're taking away? Thank you for that. Well, in Zimbabwe, we, we, we are running Zimbabwe, the, the, our development agenda under, among others, the philosophy or the mantra, Zimbabwe is open for business. By being open for business, we are saying that uh, there is a room for global investors to find an investment niche in Zimbabwe. We are saying that uh, a, you know, the development process in Zimbabwe is room for uh, various players. And these opportunities that I spoke about, they need to be showcased. But one of the best ways of showcasing them, other than me meeting people here talking to them, is giving a potential investors an opportunity to visit Zimbabwe, to talk to business people in Zimbabwe, you know, so that he, at the end of the day, we have a B2B or business to business. Uh, that is the best way to go. Uh, when they engage the policy makers closer to the theater of investment, uh, they will get their answers and a better appreciation of the investment potential uh, that Zimbabwe is. So I, I, I really think if Horasis were to go to Zimbabwe, they will not only be uh, reaching out to Zimbabwean business actors, but even the actors from the from the neighboring countries would evidently be uh, excited uh, to participate in such a, you know, an important um, a event such as the Horasis uh, meetings. I mean, we have already hosted, for example, recently we hosted the African Sea Walls Forum uh, in, in Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. So we will not only be showcasing what we are all about in investment terms, but also giving people the opportunity to enjoy Zimbabwe's tourism product, uh, which I think will give them a unique experience because the Victoria Falls itself, if it was to be the venue for the Horasis meeting, which I think will be the, the ideal uh, venue, we will give people an experience uh, to, to see what uh, a, 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 you know, a mighty tourism product the Victoria Falls itself is. And, and, and I think it's, it will be a memorable experience. Thank you, Excellency. It's going to be fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to the announcement of uh, Horasis being held in Zimbabwe. Thank you so much and thank enjoy you, the rest you. of thank the conference. Thank you so conference. much, Excellency. It's a pleasure. It's mine.